Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Neurological of Associations of COVID-19 webinar. This is our monthly webinar. Uh, many of you will have joined us with these webinars before. Um, I'm Tom Solomon. I'm based at the University of Liverpool and uh, I head the Brain Infections Global Programme. Uh, this is a programme that's been working on a range of brain infections over many years, but in the last 18 months we have been especially focused on neurological COVID disease, as have many people. We have a, a network of doctors working around the world, contributing data. Many of you are on the call, I know. Uh, we have these uh, webinars, which are approximately every month, and we have uh, various neuro resources, um, uh, including, uh, well, I'll come to those shortly. So many of you contributed uh, data to uh, this uh, meta-analysis we did, the ind independent, um, individual patient data meta-analysis. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for your contributions to that. We've written it up. It is uh, on the SSRN website and it's currently with Lancet Neurology and uh, out for review. And maybe we'll actually, uh, we've done some presentations from, from that, uh, those data, but maybe we'll uh, do more of a presentation on one of these webinars. So Brain Infections Global uh, has thousands of members around the world in various countries. Uh, as well as research, we also do teaching and education. And we're supported by the Global Health Network. Uh, so these are the tabs for some of the teaching and educational aspects, including the free online NeuroID e-learning modules and the Neurological Infectious Diseases course. We are back. Yes, we did a virtual course at the beginning of this year, which was last year's course, the 2020 course. And in 2021, we're going to be doing it in person in July. Uh, registration is filling up rapidly so if you're interested in, in coming on the course please register as soon as you can. Also I wanted to give you advance notice of the encephalitis conference which is planned for December 2021 at the Royal College of Physicians in London and again uh, for people who need help getting to that there are bursaries to help you come across for that and the society the encephalitis society also provides seed funding grants Okay, but back to our COVID neuro webinars. So the purpose is to bring the global community working on COVID neuro together. Even if they work in the same department and have never met each other until they've uh, joined one of these webinars, which happened just as we were getting ready for today. And we want to better understand the neurological presentations, complications, long-term effects and disease mechanisms of COVID-19. Keep up to date with the latest research, and then immediately after this one hour webinar, we have the WHO Clinical Exchange Network. So uh, today's webinar, we have Carolina Skagen uh, from uh, Oslo uh, University Hospital in Norway. And then Vanshika Singh is going to do the very popular JNNP blog, giving us the highlights of the recent publications. And then Dr. Thomas Teal, who's one of the co-authors on the New England Journal of Medicine paper on vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And of course, today it's all about these thrombotic events following vaccination. And just to point out that if you're seeing these thrombotic events and want to capture the data, we have a freely available data capture forms, which you can get through registering here on the Brain Infections Global website. And we may pull all the data together, just like we did for the other meta-analysis. Anyway, without further ado, let me introduce Carolina Skagen, who's going to talk about vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia causing a severe form of cerebral venous thrombosis with high fatality rate. These are the cases from Norway, some of the earliest cases to report. So, Carolina, I'll stop sharing. And if you want to share your screen and tell us what you've been seeing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, seminar. Um, I work as a consultant neurologist uh, at the vascular neurology unit at Oslo University Hospital and uh, I will present these five cases of vaccine induced uh, immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia that we saw in February March. Um, this, as you might be aware, these uh, cases have already been published and uh, in the New England Journal on 9th of April. Um, with the findings of the PF4 antibodies and also the term, uh, introducing the term vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And it's obviously a huge joint effort with, of course, the uh, hematologists having key roles 
um, and uh, also with all the, the professional groups involved uh, in the care of these patients uh, have also contributed to the publications uh, with the neurosurgeon and intensivists. So just um, for background, I will just point out that uh, Norway is a very small country in uh, North Europe and uh, the entire population um, counts 5.4 million. Um, and at our, um, uh, our country, the vaccination program started end of like late December, 2020 with uh, uh, the Pfizer vaccine um, and then um, Moderna was added in mid-January, and the first uh, vaccinations with the AstraZeneca started the second week of February. It was mainly distributed to healthcare workers, uh, which were under 65 years old, uh, and the total doses uh, in this five-week period before it was halted was just over 132,000. Uh, So I will just, uh, for context, I will give you the, no, the key numbers for Norway. I, I'm, I apologize for the bit of Norwegian, but not to worry, I will just take you through it. Uh, these are the numbers from yesterday. They're updated every day at one o'clock. And uh, left uh, top, it's the number of tested people in the country. And um, we are testing, uh, quite a lot, I would say, unspecifically, but compared to our neighboring country, we're doing a lot of uh, COVID testing. Uh, and uh, the amount of positive tests are just shy of 120,000. Uh, we have over 4,000 people admitted to hospital now with COVID. Intensive care has just over 800 patients and the death toll is 774 now, the COVID-related deaths. Uh, so it makes sense for us to compare ourselves to our neighbors, Denmark and Sweden, as we have quite comparable cultures and the health system um, and genetics. So uh, we, we see that Norway is doing relatively um, well compared to our neighbors we the population is comparable to the danish um, and sweden is twice the population um, almost of sweden and Nor uh, sorry of denmark and norway and the number of deaths are um, uh, are uh, smaller in norway compared to sweden but as you might be aware sweden had a totally different approach to the pandemic in the start and they they saw a quickly increasing number of infections. And before we move on to our patients that I will present, I'd just like to show you the uh, bar chart on the right-hand side, uh, which shows the age uh, group, the uh, distribution of deaths according to age group. So on the x-axis is the number of deaths and it's the age group on the y-axis. And the five uh, cases we encountered were in the lower age groups here. So in this two week period from 8th of February to 11th of March, we had five healthcare workers aged 32 to 55 years admitted to our center. Uh, they all presented with the dramatic uh, clinic with the cerebrovenous thrombosis they had intracerebral hemorrhages and uh, um, severe thrombocytopenia. And the common denominator for these patients were that they had all received the vaccine seven to days uh, previous, seven to 10 days previous. Uh, I'll show you this table just for some main values. We'll not go through all the results, um, but just to give you an idea, the lowest platelet counts, the third row down, um, uh, demonstrates this. Um, case number four is the only surviving case. Uh, and her lowest uh, platelet number was 70. Um, also, just like to point out the D-dimer, not surprisingly, it's a bit high for all the patients. Um, 
INR and APTT was however normal. Uh, and fibrinogen is the last one I'll comment on in the middle of the table there, uh, was just a bit low for a case two, but otherwise uh, normal for the others. Uh, so the common denominator, as I said, was the very high levels of antibodies to these PF4 complexes, um, much higher than what you would uh, see in a normal HIT patient. Um, uh, and the graph on the right is the one uh, uh, cut from the published paper in New England where we have the quantified optical densities on the y-axis and the, the presence of, uh, of antibodies in the charts. And importantly, on the functional testing, which was key for these patients and in the management further on, is that they, uh, these, the platelets were clearly activated also in the absence of heparin. So uh, this was... Uh, um, uh, we interpreted this condition as a heparin-independent uh, thrombocytopenia. Some patient data I will take you through also. Um, all the cases we, we saw were female. Um, and the age range we've commented on, they were previously well, except uh, three patients had pollen allergy and one patient was uh, hypertensive and was medicated for it. Um, the days from vaccination between seven and 10 and uh, all the patients except case four, who's the only surviving patients had uh, ecchymosis and petechiae. This was, as I said, a dramatic uh, clinical course. And you can see this from the treatment measures. Uh, three patients received uh, neurosurgery and they spent several days in ICU with, with uh, four patients um, uh, passing away. I'd just like to make a small point. Uh, we have a very small number in Norway and you have to be careful about making any statistics on five, uh, five cases. But we did look uh, at how many patients had received the vaccine and, um, and how many VITs we saw. And just, um, just to look at the, the sex difference. And uh, if you wanted to do statistics, you would see that the, there was a, um, a, such a large proportion of women getting the vaccine compared to men. So you, you wouldn't be able to say that there was a higher risk of this complication if you were a woman. Treatment. Um, this, this figure gives a timeline of admission, uh, treatment, and the outcome. Um, in parallel with the um, platelet count, which is on the y-axis, and the treatment on the x-axis. Uh, and you see case one, two, three, four, five uh, downwards. So after receiving the, the antibody results, we were uh, faced with quite a difficult decision in terms of what um, anticoagulant to administer. And these patients had been started on low molecular weight heparin, um, but as we know, this can trigger the mechanism uh, and make it worse. We didn't at this point know what, uh, 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 what this clinical entity was. Um, so we considered changing uh, as you would with a sort of a standard hit, um, but uh, we saw that the platelets were, platelets were actually rising after we'd started steroids and immunoglobulins. And that uh, coupled with the fact that these patients were facing neurosurgery and the alternatives to heparin with longer half-life and not as easily reversed, um, uh, made us conclude to continue heparin. So they all, uh, all the patients were given low molecular weight heparin. Also after the antibody results were known. So before the vaccine was halted, we start on the right, right hand side of this slide. Um, uh, 
we see that 132,000 patients were given the vaccine in this five week period. And the fatality rate was then one per about 26,000. Uh, and if you look down at the, at the bar below, the chart below this box, um, uh, it repeats what I emphasized in the start of this presentation. There's a really low mortality rate for the age, low mortality rate from COVID in the age group that uh, died from uh, VIT. So if you consider Norway in isolation, the risk benefit of the vaccine uh, for this age, age group be <laughs> became quite challenging. Uh, and there was um, a big ethical uh, debate in the media also um, about what, what should be the, the course forward, uh, should we continue to administer the vaccine. Uh, and on 10th of May, just uh, seven, eight days ago, this expert panel, uh, they had been given the task with um, advising on the further strategy of the vaccine. And they recommended that the AstraZeneca vaccine be taken out of the Norwegian National Vaccine Program. And also the same with the Johnson vaccine. So after these five cases, we have not seen any more patients uh, with this complication. So I think that concludes my presentation. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That's really nice. Lovely to see those data um, up close and personal that were first presented in the New England Journal and also the, the extra epidemiological observations that you had. Um, I mean, maybe we'll, uh, and, and of course, people can post their questions or comments in the, in the chat function. So please, please do that now. Um, maybe if we start with the epidemiology. So, um, uh, and I, I probably should point out in disclosures, I sit on the UK MHRA um, COVID-19 vaccine expert working group. So, um, you know, I've similarly looked at these data in great detail in the UK. Uh, clearly the younger, the younger age group, the, the risk of the vaccine versus the benefit of the vaccine um, suggests that uh, the, the vaccine is not helpful. But you concluded that for all patients, all people, including the older age group. So I just wanted to get your reflections on that and also on the thought that, of course, the, the benefit versus the risk, uh, the benefit of vaccination is clearly depends how much disease there is at, at any particular time, how much virus there is circulating. So if we take the UK, we currently have this Indian strain, which is causing rates to go up. And that therefore really means you sort of have to reconsider. So just it'd be good to get your thoughts on that, on the older age group and, and also whether you take account of how much virus is circulating. Hmm. Yeah, just to comment on the age group, um, the, this was, uh, as I said, just given to the under 65s. And um, so um, the, um, we, it was first given to the over 65s here. And then in second round, it was changed because of the complications in the older. So, um, they have done this um, uh, expert panel have done a recommendation based on what we saw in isolation in Norway. So they have been quite narrow in their conclusions, which I think we can maybe allow ourselves to do. Um, uh, so they have said they don't recommend it for any age group because we have an alternative vaccine. And they have added a statement saying, if the, vi if the disease, the viral, uh, the virus goes up, the cases with positive uh, tests go up, or if we, uh, there was a delay in the alternative vaccines, we might have to reconsider. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, lots of good questions coming in. So um, I'll put some of these to you. First of all, um, from Elizabeth Sell, can you tell us how many COVID patients had neurological thrombotic events as a result of COVID infection only? So this is without the vaccine 
and uh, Jean-Michel Harrod has a related question. Uh, Jean-Michel says they've seen patients with mild and asymptomatic COVID-19 with high D-dimers and high risk of thrombosis almost three weeks after COVID infection. So could some of these VIT cases be uh, due to patients who'd previously been infected with the virus, uh, not vaccine related? What, what are your thoughts mm. on that? Well, we did, all these patients were checked for COVID-19 uh, and they, they had not had the disease. So I, I don't, it's not likely that it was from a previous infection. Um, the DU dimers were high, I think. I guess it just reflects the ongoing thrombosis. All these patients, patients had massive thrombosis uh, in several cerebral veins. It's, uh, it was, um, uh, a compl it was very obvious to us that it was a sort of new clinical entity. Although we see these uh, the cerebral venous thrombosis is a, not something we see rarely, but this was something completely different in terms of the volume of uh, thrombosis. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, the, I think your, I can't remember how many of your five died, um, but it, it was quite high, wasn't it? Um, Lance Turtle in the UK asks whether the outcomes are better now that we know more about the condition. Well, we don't know the know the answer. Perhaps um, because we don't see anymore. We haven't yeah. seen anymore. Uh, we have. There's obviously the one surviving patient. She came in with uh, her platelets weren't as low as the others, um, and she was given the immunoglobulins and the steroids earlier. Uh, we have discussed this at length, but the, these patients, when uh, when they were admitted to our center, they were in really life-threatening uh, condition. They all had yeah. focal neurological signs, massive hemorrhage, and um, and were had reduced level of consciousness with bleeding both in the brain parenchymae and also in the subarachnoid space. So, so I feel very unsure that we could have. Uh, you, you can't say for certain, but I don't think this was reversible, even with yeah. treatment. Mm. We'll hear, I think, in, we'll hear from Thomas Teeley shortly about the German experience, and he may be able to answer some of these questions, because in Germany, they're continuing to use the vaccine in some groups, as we are in the UK. I think I can say that in the UK, the case fatality rate has come down, mm. um, one, partly because we are, maybe we know a bit more what we're doing with treatment, but also I think the milder cases are being reported, which perhaps were not initially spotted, you know, as is often the case, it's the severe, severe disease is how you pick up a new syndrome. And then you yeah. start looking and realizing that there's actually a bit more of it around uh, okay. that, that than you thought. Uh, Tore Beggy uh, says, um, he noted that, uh, that the only survivor did not take hormones. Do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, uh, we've also discussed this. Um... The conclusion is uh, we it's difficult to create a causal mechanism for the for the hormone uh, therapy. It's it's uh, it's um, we know it's a risk factor for thrombosis, but for the immune um, condition, uh, it's difficult. So okay. There are more questions and what I propose is that we come back to these uh, when we're going we're gonna to hear from our JNNP blogger and then we're going to hear from Thomas and then at the end we'll get everyone on to answer some more of these questions as a team. So for the moment Carolina we'll let you go and uh, Vanshika if you want to turn your camera on and your sh start sharing your screen. Uh, this is so Vanshika is actually a, a, a sub editor and staff writer with The Wire Science. So a journalist it's wonderful to have you joining us but a journalist who is interested in uh, neuroscience, psychiatry, uh, doing a DPhil in psychiatry at Oxford starting in October 2021. Um, so let's hear the latest from what's been happening out there through the JNNP blog. Thank you, Anshika. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Uh, so as you all know that we have a weekly update at the JNNP blog where we document uh, the weekly updates in, in this aspect of neurology and neuropsychiatry of COVID-19. And uh, though uh, this manifestation, the neurological and neuropsychiatric manifestations have now been very well cemented uh, with the vast amount of literature that we have, one of the critical questions that has been doing the rounds is whether uh, this infection 
is directly invading into the CNS uh, and uh, whether uh, and probing that has been one of the key uh, highlights that we have uh, uh, gone over in the past month. And in that respect, uh, work by Thakur and colleagues has uh, really given us good insights about uh, what is really happening at the neuropathological level and whether that has implication in uh, understanding uh, about uh, the route of infection. So in this particular, uh, this particular study, they uh, uh, analyzed 41 COVID-19 patients uh, in, uh, in the autopsy frame and they observed that there were some key neuropathological uh, uh, identifiers like uh, hypoxic and ischemic uh, uh, changes, uh, which are both global and focal. Uh, these were also uh, supplemented with large and small infarcts, which were hemorrhagic. And one of the key observations was my mitral activation and nodules, particularly in the brainstem, uh, specifically involving the medulla and the cerebellum. The key takeaway from this uh, particular paper was that the histopathological alterations did not uh, correlate with the uh, uh, iron and protein viral levels that were present in the brain parenchyma, which they ascertained with the uh, QRT-PCRs and different immunohistochemistry uh, techniques. And, uh, they found that uh, they found that the levels of the RNA uh, and protein of the virus were not uh, particularly high or even detectable in some instances, uh, as they were in the nasal epithelium. However, uh, there was definite microglial activation, uh, and there was definitely a lot of neuro uh, neuronophagia as well. And the colleagues and, and uh, this group as a uh, sort of uh, proposed that this could be because of some sort of systemic inflammation uh, uh, processes that might be occurring, uh, that might be induced by hypoxia instead of a direct CNS invasion. So moving on from what could be causing these, uh, so moving on from what could be causing uh, these uh, uh, manifestations to what is the after effect or the prolonged or protracted effect that we see uh, in long COVID mostly, uh, some people from our very group, Neuropsych COVID, have put together this systemic, uh, systemic review and meta-analysis uh, uh, where we uh, saw that there was, uh, uh, where we saw the prevalence of uh, what these neuropsychiatric, neuropsychiatric manifestations uh, played out as, and uh, by using some primary pool prevalence, uh, we got to know that uh, there are some uh, particularly high, highly occurring uh, manifestations or uh, symptoms like insomnia, fatigue, uh, cognitive impairment, and anxiety disorders, even after six months of the infection. And uh, one of the key takeaways from this uh, meta-analysis was that, was that these protracted uh, uh, you know, symptoms was not limited to the post-acute phase or even recovery from severe COVID-19 only. So that was not very much dependent on uh, uh, the time point after which we were seeing, because even uh, within uh, 12 weeks and even after 12 weeks, the uh, uh, symptoms were protracted. Uh, now coming on to uh, the thrust of today's talk, which is, uh, uh, CVST symptoms and uh, thrombocytopenia that is occurring after vaccination. Uh, this particular paper by C. et al. Uh, documented 12 US patients who showed these symptoms following a Johnson & Johnson vaccination. Uh, the key point to note was that they were all white women who were aged between 18 to 60. And uh, in addition to CVST and uh, thrombocytopenia, they also had intracerebral hemorrhage and non-CVST thrombosis. Uh, one point of caution was that uh, seven of these 12 patients had at least one of these CVST risk, risk factors already, and uh, with obesity being the most major one, and others including hyperthyroidism and oral contraceptive use. And some of the mechanisms that have been implicated or were being proposed was uh, that there are some antibodies uh, because of the heparin because of some constituents of this vaccine uh, that could be uh, inducing uh, antibodies against the platelets. But 
that is a very uh, uh, that is something that has uh, has to be taken with caution and needs further studies. And we also must understand that the frequency of these uh, cases has been very low. For example, uh, six cases up to uh, April 12th uh, with this vaccine were noted amongst um, around seven million doses that have been administered. So. The critical question definitely is whether there is indeed, if any, causal relationship between uh, this vaccination and uh, these rare symptoms and these rare events that we are witnessing. Uh, so for this, another uh, work by some people from the group have uh, gone on to uh, gone on to study that uh, there, these adverse events may be very rare, but uh, they're not very well supported by any definitive causal association between the adverse events and the vaccination. Uh, and this was a certain and uh, being probed by using different causality analysis criteria like that Bird Hill or WHO. And uh, well, there has to be more uh, analysis that we would uh, require to definitely ascertain that, that, but that is where the narrative is now uh, really shifted. So that's all from our end. And we hope that you guys are tuned to this amazing team. And I've been glad that I could be part and I'm learning a lot uh, from this. And if anybody is interested to join the team, uh, please do email and reach out to us on Twitter. Thank you so much. Brilliant, Vanshika. Thank you very much for that. Um, we Some real food for thought there and um, a marked bias towards presentations, uh, towards papers from people who are in our team, including Kiran Thacker, who, who uh, led that autopsy study. So that either means that this is really where everything's happening or it means that we are rather too nepotistic. Um, but you probably, Vanshika, didn't even know Kieran Thacker is on the call. So um, I suspect it's just the random nature uh, of choosing good papers. But thank you very much for that. And we, I think we'll be, I suspect we'll be discussing some of those at the end. So stick around. And meanwhile, sure. Thomas Thiele, if you want to uh, turn your camera on and start uh, sharing your screen, it's great to have Thomas with, the, with us. He is a haematologist, not a neurologist, and he's at the uh, Greifswald University. I'm not sure I've said that correctly. Greifswald? How do you say it, Thomas? I think it's Greifswald, <laughs> but that's the very German pronunciation at that time. You, Greifswald, you should know. And I actually had to, I did look up where it was. And for those who, who are interested, it's right up at the top of Germany on the coast, quite near the border with Poland, I think. Yeah, isn't it's it? just uh, uh, clo very close to the Baltic Sea. So Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, he's worked on platelet biology, immunology and platelet transfusions for more than 10 years and heads the hemostasis service at the University Hospital. And he also is going to present uh, data that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you so, very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Okay. So I can begin. So my topic will be the same as uh, uh, our Norwegian uh, colleagues just introduced, which is vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And I would like to start with uh, the clinical observation, which we got to know uh, at the end of February, uh, beginning of March 21, so this year, because in Germany, we began uh, to uh, vaccinate people with the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, with the beginning of this year. So it's, uh, it was pretty early and um, it was uh, told uh, also through the media that several cases of unusual thrombotic events um, occurred after vaccination with uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And, and it was uh, uh, written that those patients developed thrombocytopenia, cerebral vein thrombosis, and also uh, splanchnikus vein thrombosis about uh, four to 20 days after vaccination. And um, we uh, uh, got aware of some of these cases, which were from Austria and Germany, and Sabine Eichinger from Austria, which is a, a close friend uh, of our group, um, came to us with a patient she was dealing with. And uh, this patient had a very severe thrombocytopenia on the one hand, but on the other hand, it uh, 
uh, this patient had uh, thrombosis. So this is the index case one you can uh, appreciate here. And that was a, a thrombosis uh, in the arteria, by the way. And um, the thrombocyte platelets were about uh, 13,000, uh, so pretty low. But also this patient had a cere cerebral uh, vein thrombosis at the same time. So unusual thrombosis but also thrombocytopenia. And this is uh, a clinical picture, which is pretty much familiar with a, a syndrome we know and we are dealing with for about 30 years now. Um, and um, the second step here, you should appreciate that the timing of these symptoms after vaccination is pretty close, always about five to 20 days after the vaccination. So we are dealing with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And I would like to explain to you what is meant by this disease, because it's a pretty rare syndrome, which we see and which we diagnose in our laboratory um, after people get uh, treated with heparin, uh, one of the most used anticoagulants worldwide. So, um, it all starts with the administration of uh, heparin. And uh, heparin forms a complex with a protein which comes from the platelets, which is PF4, platelet factor 4, which is in the alpha granules of the platelets. And it is released upon platelet activation. So this protein forms a complex together with heparin. And this leads to the uh, binding of antibodies which can recognize these PF4 heparin complexes. And this PF4 heparin immune complex is now able to activate platelets via the FC gamma receptor. So you got an antibody mediated immune thrombosis syndrome. And this leads to thrombocytopenia. And thrombocytopenia and platelet activation is able to activate the coagulation cascade. And this leads to thrombosis and to all these uh, uh, stuff you can see in those patients, meaning thrombocytopenia and uh, uh, low platelets and uh, platelet activation with thrombosis. So this is happening in HIT. And you can also appreciate that HIT has a pretty similar time pattern to what we see in the patients with vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. So here is the, uh, the cause of patients who uh, uh, undergo major surgery and who are treated with uh, low molecular weight heparin afterwards. And if those patients develop a drop of platelet counts again after surgery, and which is uh, more than 50% of the initial platelet count, and which is between day 5 and day 10 or day 5 and day 15, then we uh, suggest heparin-induced thrombocytopenia because we see the same pattern here of thrombocytopenia and thrombosis in those patients treated with heparin. So the, the pattern of HIT uh, means that platelets decrease uh, about more than 50% between day 5 and 15 after the exposure to heparin. We see also unusual arterial and venous thrombosis in those patients. And we can diagnose this disease by, uh, uh, by identifying IgG antibodies, which are directed against the PF4 heparin complexes, which I have shown you in the cartoon. So with this, keeping this in mind, we uh, addressed the new syndrome of WIT uh, with the first patients we, we saw uh, in Germany and in Austria. And we could see that when we look at antibodies, then uh, we, uh, we also get to see PF4 heparin, high titer antibodies in those patients, which makes us uh, think, OK, do we see the same antibodies which we uh, see in, in HIT patients? When we add heparin, this is a conformational step. Uh, the antibody reaction goes down. But 
the new observation for VIT patients was that we can see antibodies directed against platelet factor 4 alone. So we don't need heparin, we don't need the whole uh, immune complex here. We only have antibodies which can bind to PF4 alone. And this is something new for the pattern of vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. So the next step in diagnosing uh, heparin heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is to use a functional assay. And this functional assay uh, works that way that we can identify antibodies which are able to activate platelets via the FC gamma receptor. And this is a pretty old test published by Professor Greinacher in 1991 already where you can appreciate some cloudy uh, multi-tata uh, plate uh, holes here and also some very clear ones. And uh, the clear ones uh, indicate platelet activation because there you can uh, uh, see the light going through the tube without any uh, disturbance. So this is pretty much what we see in hit positive patients here with platelets which are activated by the antibodies uh, against PF4 immune complexes. And we performed the same test now for the VIT patients. And uh, you can appreciate that buffer alone is able, so buffer alone and VIT zera are able to activate platelets. But when we add a little bit of heparin, uh, the reaction goes down. So what you, you see here is the reaction time where we see the platelets being activated in the, in the tube. And um, a very long time means that this is a, a negative test and a very short time in uh, minutes means that we have a strong platelet activation uh, with a very, very early signal. And when we now add platelet factor 4 alone, we see a very, very, very strong platelet activation in those patients. You can appreciate that between uh, um, the start of the reaction and 10 minutes, almost every patient uh, is positive in this platelet activation assay. When we use unfractionated heparin as a confirmation step, it's also a negative uh, uh, picture, but this is only a, a, a negative control. When we use IVIG, just right here in the tube, we can also inhibit this reaction. And this means that the VIT pattern consists of thrombocytopenia and thrombosis four to 20 days after vaccination against COVID-19 with the adenoviral vector-based vaccines. And we can talk about on that later. We have strongly positive PF4 heparin IgG ELISA tests, so immunoassays which can detect those antibodies. And they, those can get uh, positive also with heparin together, which may uh, misdirect you uh, in a way that you may think of a hit pattern here. But this is not the case because we can see that those uh, IgG uh, is able to uh, activate platelets in presence of PF4 alone. So we don't need heparin. And this was published also for the uh, Ad, uh, AstraZeneca vaccines and uh, also for the uh, Johnson vaccine. So the treatment uh, very early for those, those patients is the administration of IVIG, very high dose, uh, one gram per kilogram on two consecutive days. And uh, this treatment is able to inhibit or to block the platelet activation mechanism. So you reduce the risk of thrombosis here just by uh, blocking the petal mechanism. And the anticoagulation with non-heparin anticoagulant is also uh, uh, proposed for those patients because we see some cross-reaction also with, uh, with heparin, uh, which might be that uh, heparin can be a bad idea to use. However, it is not clear at that stage whether you can use heparin uh, without uh, uh, danger in those patients. It is recommended to use a non-heparin anticoagulant, which can be agatroban, it can be with the DOEX, uh, and also with uh, 
uh, Danaparoid, for example. This has been published very early and right away with our uh, laboratory studies uh, in, uh, from the German uh, Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. So we now know that these uh, cases are not over just by giving one dose IV IG. Um, um, we have, uh, I'm, I'm, I know one case uh, with a severe uh, sinus vein thrombosis um, and who had a prolonged cause of VIT. And you uh, may see here the platelet count course. And the platelets, you can see all, uh, they go down again after a first course of IVIG treatment. And we had to use at least uh, three further doses of IVIG to stabilize the platelet count. And we also added uh, 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 corticosteroids uh, at the end. And this, to, to, uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, was able to resolve this problem. So it must not be over after one dose of IVIG. And it, uh, I would recommend to uh, clearly monitor the platelet causes uh, and the platelet counts of those patients uh, even after, uh, uh, um, after discharge. So one last uh, uh, thing I would like to mention here is how to deal with these PF4 polyanion antibodies. And um, what is meant by this? We know from heparin-induced thrombocytopenia that you can have several classes of antibodies, and two classes of them are very much less dangerous because they are not able to cause thrombosis. And these antibodies you can appreciate here uh, in a so-called iceberg model. And with this iceberg model, you have a lot of people carrying PF4 heparin antibodies, but none of them develops thrombosis. And only the very strong antibodies, which we call group three antibodies, which is not the tip of the iceberg, but the flag on the tip of the iceberg. Very few people develop a syndrome which is called autoimmune hit. And this means that you have antibodies which can uh, trigger immune thrombosis in the absence of heparin. And um, we may look at a similar picture when we look at VIT. And um, what you need to know is that these PF4 antibodies can occur after, uh, during inflammation, after trauma, and after uh, cardiac surgery and major surgery uh, increases the risk of a positive PF4 heparin IgG antibody, but most of these antibodies are not dangerous. And why am I telling you that? Because we found out that you can measure those antibodies even after administration of different vaccines. Here you can see the BioNTech uh, vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we tested some of our uh, hospital workers who uh, vac were vaccinated with either uh, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine or the, the AstraZeneca vaccines. And both develop uh, uh, afterwards these uh, low titer and not dangerous antibodies. So this means if you screen those patients when they are, uh, or if you screen people um, who are not symptomatic and you find antibodies just within ELISA and you see those antibodies, this is uh, not, uh, you, you should do this with caution because uh, these antibodies are not VIT antibodies, which can cause the VIT syndrome. These VIT antibodies are very high titer and they can activate platelets. And this is uh, uh, this you have to keep in mind when you are using just a HIT test to, to exclude VIT in, a, in an otherwise asymptomatic patient, which I don't recommend you to do. And uh, this is my last slide. Uh, you may see, see that uh, some of those uh, uh, antibody tests may be very sophisticated. At the end of the day, we have published recently a flow cytometry-based assay where you can use whole blood and you can diagnose with. And if you uh, 
would like to uh, uh, see how we do this, you can read this in Bloodwood because it was already published two weeks ago. And um, I would appreciate all of our collaborators and I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. Lovely, thank you very much, that's super. So if you want to stop sharing your screen. Yes. And uh, again, we have lots of questions. I don't know if Carolina would like to join us again, but let me get started with the first question, uh, which is around uh, how many vaccines uh, people had had, whether you think you're seeing this after two, after the second shot of, of um, a adenovirus vector vaccine or whether it's always the first shot. So the patients we were uh, we got aware of uh, have all developed the syndrome after the first st uh, yeah. shot, because uh, uh, we have uh, changed our schedule from initially about uh, 28 days after the first uh, vaccination. We now uh, wait for uh, uh, 12 weeks. Yes, after we deliver the second shot of AstraZeneca, yeah. and this is just now the time where we begin to uh, vaccinate people for the second time here. So um, I cannot uh, comment on, on, on the risk yeah. for the second so shot here. The question uh, came, uh, um, Caroline, I think all of yours were first shot as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, the questions come from Ella Maysami. And in fact, Ella, we have in the UK, we've seen a small number of second shots as well, but mostly first shots. Libby Van Tonder, a friend of ours, a neurosurgeon, wants to just ask about the timing of decompressive neurosurgery uh, for either of you, um, whether you'd like to comment on that. And maybe also to comment on uh, one issue we've had in, in the UK is clearly we, I think most people feel that giving platelets makes things worse. Um, but if platelets are very low and someone's going to neurosurgery, we sort of have this feeling that you might just be able to give them to give cover for an hour or two during the neurosurgery. Do you have, Caroline, did you have a, um, experience of that? Yeah, I mean, we were unsure about giving the platelets for sure, but uh, at least for the three last ones, the, the first two ones we who came in, we really didn't know what kind of clinical picture we were seeing. Uh, and when on the Friday and the news came out of this possible link, that's when we started treating with uh, steroids and, uh, and uh, immunoglobulins. Um, the platelets, yeah, for sure. I mean, with a hit picture, you would be very hesitant, but uh, these were uh, life-threatening bleeds. So I guess that's yeah. the exception and we just had to give it uh, before surgery. Thomas is nodding along, agreeing to that, I think. Um, um, yes. We've had in the Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, just very, very briefly. I it is not recommended to 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 give in such a prothrombotic situation platelets. However, if you have to do decompressive surgery, which is a life saving uh, operation at this time point when the decision is made, um, I would recommend to start surgery and when it starts bleeding, just to administer platelets as well. Because what we see is, on the one hand, a strong platelet activation and thrombosis. But on the other hand, those people can also de develop severe bleeding symptoms at the same time, which for me seems that we have additional uh, uh, an additional phenomenon here that people might start to bleed. So to avoid platelets whenever you can would be, I think, the, the right way. But if you have no other choice, you should give them. Yeah, thanks. Um, David Nicholl, who is a neurologist in Birmingham uh, and uh, always likes to throw in a little bit of controversy uh, in relation to the discussion of benefit versus risk. He's in the chat. He's pointing us to the figures uh, for, of COVID cases in Norway and is, is suggesting that following the pausing of the AZ vaccine in many countries in Norway, the COVID cases overall went up. Um, were you aware of that, Caroline? I mean, this is, he's done a quick and dirty, I think it's a Google search, but is that a feeling? In, in the oh, he's absolutely right. It did, but also restrictions. Uh, uh, the, the, we were hit by the wave anyway, I think. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure you can, you can uh, okay. do a caution. So he's, <laughs> he, he's not quick and dirty then, he's right on this occasion. Now, Kieran Thacker, says, uh, do you know whether there was delay in diagnosis from symptom onset uh, in your cases? This is quite common in CV CVT. 
any moment to us. So I can tell you that most of the patients have severe headache, and this is an, uh, a quite a new onset of those headaches. So uh, I don't think that we have uh, missed the diagnosis for a very long time in, in most of them. Hmm. And just quickly, I, I'm afraid we maybe they did come, a few of our, ours, at least three came late, and they, one of them actually went to A&E and was sent home again. Uh, with these patechiae and again it was they came early so we didn't really know about this complication um, okay. so I think now hopefully we would have picked them up but yeah certainly a bit late. A um, question about disease mechanisms from uh, Maddie Hornig should we be looking at uh, netosis as part of this? So we have looked. We have out, already yeah. uh, looked on netosis, and uh, there is a lot of netosis in in these patients. We can see that uh, when you uh, uh, look at the thrombi, there are a lot of leukocytes within the thrombi. That's the first one, and then we can also uh, can see this in the mouse model. We have already done this, and uh, we see severe netosis in these uh, kind of platelet activation and mechanism. But for the neurologists who, uh, when they did hematology hundreds of years ago, netosis doesn't exist. Do you want to remind people or educate people in two sentences what netosis is? So netosis is a mechanism which is promoted by uh, neutrophils, and these uh, cells can uh, extra uh, uh, or they can uh, release uh, uh, DNA, and this is creating a net right within the circulation very basically and uh, this is also uh, forming the the background where platelets can get activated so uh, it is a pro thrombotic mechanism with uh, uh, with leukocytes together with platelets okay we're, we're going to move on in a second i just wanted to ask you both in the uk we're we're, we're writing up our series of patients we we, we wrote up the first few uh, published in the New England Journal, but we're writing up more of the CBSTs now, and we're having ferocious discussions about case definitions, and in particular, uh, whether we're happy with the platelet cutoff being 150, and also, um, what about patients who uh, have a platelet drop, but it's still higher than 150? I think you said, Thomas, uh, five days is, is the typical time period for a platelet drop after heparin. But have you got any thoughts about how we handle those numbers in terms of case definitions? So I would be uh, uh, I would be hesitant to use a too narrow window for thrombocytopenia definitions here because we don't know exactly or we don't know this uh, disease for a very long time. And um, what we also have seen in our laboratory are some patients with normal platelet counts, but also with uh, strong with antibodies and with the thrombosis. So at the end of the day, I would not uh, recommend uh, to use a very low platelet count as a cutoff and to be rather wide in your definition. Okay. And Thank just, just one, one remark, yeah. one very quick remark. Oh, hello, uh, uh, because if you have a drop of platelets and your initial platelet count is about uh, 400,000 somewhere uh, at these levels, you can have a 50% drop and also still have normal platelet counts. So you don't know the pre-existing values and you need to keep that in mind too. Of course, yeah. Okay, so we're about to move over, but I'll just summarize the last few comments and questions as we move across to the next session of the day, um, which is, uh, there's a question from Matt Jones about, have we seen lots of extracranial hemorrhage or only intracerebral? I think mostly intracerebral. Would you guys nod and agree with that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, David Nicholl, quick and dirty, uh, wants to do a neurosurgical trial because some of the neurosurgeons are very nervous, understandably, about doing surgery with uh, thrombocytopenia. But when you look at these patients, you look at their scans, there's so much hemorrhage and so much swelling I, I think if you don't let the steam out, the patient's going to end up in the in the morgue. So I, I think we have to encourage our neurosurgeons to be brave. Um, OK, let's just see if there's anything else critical here. Uh, there's discussion in the chat about headaches. I'll just encourage people to look at that because we are at this moment going to thank Thomas and Carolina uh, for some wonderful presentations and discussion. So thank you very much for that.